Hey, good morning, gentlemen. It's Mr. O'Brien here. Hey, I'm going to continue to talk about the war in Asia from 1918 to 1937. We talked about that a little bit, and we decided that the United States was completely neutral, even though there are a lot of people in America who realized that Japan was actually trying to grab empire here, and that during the First World War, they'd been our friends simply because they'd hoped to gain a lot of territory, in which they did, including a lot of islands in the Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, from Germany. We also talked about the Washington Naval Conference, 553. America could build five battleships, Britain could build five, but Japan could only build three. Of course, the Japanese agreed, but you know, quite frankly, they did exactly what they wanted to do. Their construction projects were in total secret. We also talked about that the answer to their questions for all materials was going to be Manchuria. They took it. They caused an incident, the Mukan incident on a bridge in China, where Japanese soldiers dressed up like Chinese soldiers and attacked the Japanese army. Sounds a lot like Adolf Hitler in Poland, doesn't it? And we began to see that slowly but surely the military began to take over the government of Japan. When the League of Nations boycotted Japan, it hurt them. They needed those raw materials, especially petroleum and the scrap metal that the United States was sending them. But then Japan decided to get even. They simply decided to walk out of the League of Nations and do exactly what they wanted to do. We also talked about our friend Chiang Kai-shek in China and how China was kind of stuck between the Soviet Union, Japan, and a bit of a civil war between the communists and the nationalists. We realized that if we had any chance of fighting against the Japanese, that the nationalists and the communists would have to league together for a while to stop this menace from Japan. It was a mess. We also talked about our first time together about how Japan decided to set the tone. Today, that city is called Namjing. Then it was called Namking. And the government told the Japanese soldiers that you could do whatever you wanted to do. Murder, genocide, rape, arson. It's considered to be one of the greatest war crimes of the 20th century. Even a $25 million loan from the United States, it was just an eyedropper, man. It really, what they needed was American troops. We also talked about the fact that the Soviets had always been an enemy of Japan, even when they were not communists. Even when the czars, they always fought against each other. So the question was, do we turn north against the Soviets? Or do we turn and try to take colonial possessions? Do we go to the Southeast Asia? Or do we against the Soviet Union? And in the end, the idea of grabbing colonies in Southeast Asia for resources won out. You can also see that Japan took the idea of aircraft carriers very seriously. We, on the other hand, just simply thought it was some sort of science project. We didn't take it seriously at all. It's a mistake that we didn't do that. This is Ariki Tojo, they called him the Razor. At one time he was in control of the secret police and he's going to become the Prime Minister of Japan and basically force the Emperor into realizing that a strong army and navy is the only way to build empire. And though we're going to keep the Soviet Union at task, we're going to expand into China, but our real target is the Southwest Pacific, the United States. And if you look at this map very closely, and don't worry if you don't pick it up now, later we can show it to you on, um, on the PowerPoints. There'll be two sections, one for audio and this I hope. You can see all the dark spots belong to the Empire of Japan, starting from about 1937 all the way up to 1943, okay? This is the map from 41. How did they get Vietnam? Because the French surrendered to Germany, and Germany gave Vietnam to the Japanese. They got it 
for nothing. Men, the Japanese were very impressed on how much the Germans were winning in the West. It seemed that the Blitzkrieg was the example for the Japanese. They truly believed that if the Germans could do it, we could do it too. And so they began to copy the German model of audacity, speed, absolute total control over the people, using propaganda in the newspapers, and building a cult of military personalities. The government will soon not have a choice but to allow the generals and the admirals to do exactly what they want to do. This is called the Great Gamble. And the Great Gamble was basically we make peace with Russia so we can deal with the United States. And you know what? It was shown, and they knew it, that if they fought with the United States and it was a long war, they would lose. It had to be a knockout blow, something so audacious that it prevented the American people from getting the guts to fight them. This may be a bad analogy, but this was a 9-11 event. And that 9-11 event, trying to knock us out of the war and discourage the American people from resisting, was called Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in December of 1941. It was a very strategic gamble. Everybody knew that if Japan won the opening rounds and America got off the mat, that America would come back with a vengeance. And they were right. They hit us, and they hit us hard. But we got off the mat. And once the American industrial might got going, Japan didn't have a chance. Men, the Japanese do something really interesting. They join the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. In fact, Hitler was encouraged because he knew that the Japanese had not lost a war in over 4,000 years. The United States was using back-channel diplomacy and asked the Dutch if they would cut off all the supplies of Japan because Japan has absolutely, positively very little oil. We even told them that we'll make up for your losses. We want to try to strangle Japan out of doing anything aggressive. Men, these are very interesting back-channel deals, but they're not going to stop the Japanese from their master plan of building empire. Men, Lend-Lease is interesting. It is a policy during World War II where we'll give our friends everything. Guns, boots, butter, radios, weapons, airplanes, ships, everything except soldiers. And when the war is over, you can pay us back. I can assure you, no one ever paid us back. With the idea of giving Lend-Lease, we thought it could buy us some time. Unfortunately, a lot of that money will not go to China to fight against the Japanese. Because General Chang was corrupt, a lot of that money is going to go into secret bank accounts for his own personal use. But we'll talk about that some other time. So men, negotiations are going slowly, and the Japanese really don't believe that we will leave our nest of isolationism come all the way across the Pacific Ocean to stop them. And for a while, they were right. Men, Japan is going to do the following. It wasn't just Pearl Harbor. Indochina, Dutch East Indies, British Malaya, American Philippines, right? Freezing Japanese assets are not giving enough to stop these people. The miniature of Tojo assumes all power in 1941, and he's on a military footing. Roosevelt is very scared. He did not know if Hirohito would even talk. The United States is not ready for war. In fact, we're the 17th rank country in the military at that time. We just couldn't and wouldn't believe that another war was possible. So we cut off their petroleum. We cut off their steel. We cut off their aid. And unbeknownst to us, it really did hurt the Japanese badly. Then the Japanese do something really incredible, right? They tell 
to the Americans that they will withdraw from Indochina if we will just leave them alone when it comes to everything else. We will come out of Indonesia. We'll leave you alone. Just give us Manchuria, and, it's, and, it's, and that's and then by November 25th. If you do that, we'll play ball. We just want, we don't want the whole cake. We just want a little slice of it. Men, you know, Roosevelt didn't believe that they were going to make a deal trading countries. And he believed that they were secretly moving for war. And this idea of a secret treaty, Indonesia, he didn't believe it. And the American people didn't believe it either. So the die is cast. At that particular time, in Hawaii was an American territory. And this is Oahu, the big island. And it's perfect. If you look at the illustration, on the bottom of that island to the south, you can see that's Hawaii. I mean, that's Pearl Harbor. It's a perfect inlet in a mountainous island. The only problem there is that the water is pretty shallow. But there's only one way in and only one way out. And there's a big island in the middle. It looks like a donut, like an atoll. And that's where all our great battleships are going to be stationed. And luckily, our aircraft carriers are supposed to be stationed there too, but they were not there. They were out on maneuvers, sending airplanes to Midway. How lucky. Because if the aircraft carriers would have been there, I think this would have been a short war for us. But there's only one way in and one way out. Now, the Japanese did something interesting. We'll talk about in our next episode. The Japanese brought many submarines with them. And when the attack began, before the attack began, they were hoping these mini submarines could sneak into the harbor. They knew when the submarine nets would be open, launch torpedoes at escaping ships, and put a cork in the bottle. And then those 300-plus Japanese fighter planes, torpedo bombers, and dive bombers would knock the Pacific fleet out. And it was the knockout punch that they were hoping for. Men, they got close. They got very close. You see this over here? Torah, Torah, Torah. That means tiger, tiger, tiger. That's the code word that the attack has been successful. And if you look on the left, the giant Japanese fleet, they went on great extents to make everything secret. Even though they ran into three or four fishing fleets, one of them Dutch, who sent this information to the United States that there was a large carrier fleet heading out, the United States just didn't seem to heed the warning. To this day, we're still trying to figure that out. Awful, high, awful hard men to hide an entire aircraft fleet, carriers and everything. You could spend a lot of time studying this stuff, men, and a lot of historians do. We don't think there was a conspiracy theory. We don't think that they were trying to get the United States to come out of neutrality by allowing Pearl Harbor to happen. And we really don't think that Roosevelt knew ahead of time that something horrible like this was going to happen. Well, I hope everything's going well for you. And uh, that'll be the end of this conclusion. And I'll make sure that this is up on topics. Have a good day. Looking forward to seeing you again.